Yes, good afternoon, everybody. A warm welcome to you. Welcome to this House of Commons debate about Europe, and it's organized by Human Rights Watch and the Bali. My name is Marcia Leit, and I'm happy to be your chair this afternoon. Um, before we start, please make sure you've got your phones on a silent mode, because um, that helps. Yeah, the timing of this debate, that is not accidental, actually. Um, we are three months now before the European parliamentary elections. Um, they will be held in May, and uh, this afternoon we want to explore like the major controversial topics when it comes to the EU and human rights. So we will be talking about refugees, about democracy and about counter-terrorism. We do this with three Dutch members of the European Parliament. They're sitting there. Let me introduce them to you. There's in the middle Sophie Innesveld. She's a member of D66, the Democrats 66 party, and she's the first vice president of ALDE. Then next to her is Judith Sargentini, and she's of the Dutch Greens. And on the left is Kati Piri. She's the Turkey Rapporteur and European Parliamentarian for the Social Democrats. Then from the Dutch Parliament, on your right is Anne Mulder. He's a member of the VVD. And then second from the left is our only non-political expert, Philippe Dam, and he's Human Rights Advocacy Director for Europe and Central Asia. A warm welcome to all of you. So we're in the setting of a House of Commons debate, which is a bit um, different from the debates that we usually do here in the Bali. Um, it's definitely more, uh, there's more protocol. And um, I thought, let me explain a bit the rules of the game for you. Because um, this afternoon we will discuss three statements on hot topics with respect to EU and human rights. And um, on these discussions, uh, both the audience and our speakers will participate. So you are part of the debate as well. The speakers will always begin here at this table uh, and next the audience can join. Um, who wants to say something in a debate has to stand up. You stand up, that's telling me um, I want to say something. Um, you can speak when I give you the floor and the maximum time you can speak every time is one minute. And sometimes you just have to look over your shoulder because uh, there's a countdown on the screens. Um, here is the most important thing. The audience with every statement will be split in a pro and a contra. And that will just be by chance. So um, that means you will probably have to argue once in favor, and not, you know, in favor or against. And that's regardless of your own opinion. Maybe hard, but um, my experience is that it, it, it results in very um, a creative arguing and it's actually it's good fun. Um, so it, it's going to be very interesting, I'm sure about that. I need something there. Uh, I need help of two people. Um, I don't know if there are any volunteers, because otherwise we'll just, you know, look. I need a jury, a jury of two persons for those two chairs, because after every statement and every debate, um, one party has to be... Um, has to be the winner. And winning is on the content of your arguments, but please don't forget it's also about rhetorica. It's also very much how you put your arguments forward. Is there anybody who wants to volunteer being a member of our jury? Okay, please do, you can take that chair. Um, and is there anybody else who wants to volunteer? We need, we need two, I think. Please do. Um, I'm thinking that it's a good idea that your chairs are together instead of apart. So you can deliberate a little bit. So, thank you. Yeah, and um, our speakers, as they are politicians, it would be very awkward if they had to plea, you know, in favor or against their own, uh, their own ideas. So they can indicate whether they're in favor or against with a red or a green card. As Katy Pierre already said, imagine somebody would be, you know, like filming us and then in campaign, she would really get in, into trouble. Um, so there's some, a few golden debating rules for this um, House of Commons debate. One is we agree to disagree. So we adhere to courtesy at all times. Um, then you address your uh, opponents with arguments, not on the person. Um, that also goes for speakers, of course. Um, you have to substantiate your position with good arguments. So uh, don't forget, or you said that rhetorica matters. 
And there's a very important rule of equal arms. That's why we work with the timer. So there has to be a level playing field with equal time to all sides. And then every debater gets the opportunity to react and clarify his point. Um, we're planning to finish at six, six o'clock sharp. Um, yeah, and let's try and start with our first topic. We will kick off with an issue that has been a lot in the news lately. Um, several governments within the European Union have been violating fundamental democratic principles. Think of pre free press and uh, independent judiciary. Yeah, please take a seat. We still have a lot of chairs. Thank you, yeah, I know you just came from the other side. Um, good to have you here. Um, in case you're wondering what you got into, you're in a House of Commons debate. Um, you don't know yet on what side you'll be arguing later on, but you know, uh, you're know you part of the debate and um, everything will, you know, it will work out and you'll, you'll <laughs> you're looking at me as if you're shocked, but yes, um, you're gonna participate as well, uh, we hope. <laughs> Um, we just wanted to kick off with the first issue, and uh, so that's this issue of um, uh, EU members violating fundamental human rights if it comes to democracy and uh, free press, independent judiciary, these things. And this presents EU members with a very difficult dilemma, because uh, what can you do about them? How can you stick to principles regardless of, of geopolitics? Well, we want to start with the case of Poland in a film by Human Rights Watch. Can we see that film? Is that okay? Let's have a look. Since the Law and Justice Party came to power in 2015, Poland's government has tried to take total control of the judicial system. To many people, issues concerning independence of judi judiciary seems to be quite abstract and quite distant from their daily life. In my opinion, uh, the change concerning judiciary may affect everybody. 2017 was the year of fight for independence of judiciary in Poland. There were different laws proposed by the parliament, but there were also people protesting on streets in more than 200 Polish cities. You know, Parliament has passed a series of crippling laws, including one that completely undermines the independence of the Supreme Court. And on July the 3rd, dozens of Supreme Court judges are going to be dismissed from their jobs. Step by step, institution by institution, they were subject of taking over by the ruling party. They were subject of political subordination. When you create that kind of atmosphere, then you cannot expect always that judges will behave in accordance with their professional integrity. All of this creates, uh, in my opinion, the atmosphere of so-called chilling effect, such that within their minds they perfectly understand what is the thin red line they should not cross. Without meaningful checks and balances, Basic human rights are at risk, like women's rights or press freedom. So this is where the European Commission has to come in. Poland, as a member of the EU, must maintain fundamental rights, including independent courts. The European Commission was right to use Article 7 against Poland because that's the tool it has to deal with governments that put human rights at risk. Now it's time for every other EU government to stand up until Poland once again really has genuinely independent courts. Yes, and then I wanted to ask Philippe Dam to come forward to this lecture and to elaborate a little bit on, uh, on this issue. Philippe. Thanks, Marcia. Um, Europe has been struggling with the emergence of leaders who um, are taking a pride um, in their contempt to rule of law and human rights and who are convincing their supporters that their rights can be fulfilled to the detriment of the rights of others, that uh, institutions um, in their countries uh, should work for the majority and not anymore for the minorities. Um, in Poland, such as we saw in this video, but also in Hungary, uh, we have been seeing this situation affecting, first of all, the courts, 
uh, in Poland, it's no less than it's been no less than a little purge of the justice system, where judges deemed to be seen as more hostile to the ruling party have been pushed out of their jobs, and new ones closer to the ruling party being appointed or promoted. The second target of such governments have been the media. In Hungary, again, uh, what we are seeing is a total takeover from the public media, but also from private media, who are now owned mostly uh, by supporters of the Fidesz party. Um, what we are seeing as well is that, that it gives the capacity to uh, those media to invoke Soros or Orban, uh, sorry, Soros or migrants um, in response to any social or political debate in the country. And the third target have been civil society organizations. Uh, in Hungary, again, we've seen uh, in Hungary, again, we've been seeing uh, laws being almost a copy and paste from Russia's anti-NGO uh, legislations. Um, the reason why they are attacking those institutions um, is uh, not only because they are obstacles to their policies, but because they are obstacles to them remaining in power. No wonder why Orban is going after the courts and the media at the moment when uh, accusations of corruptions or mismanagements of public fundings, including EU fundings, are emerging, including in our own media. But let's not fool ourselves. Um, the many attacks on women's rights in Poland or uh, on labor rights uh, in Hungary, as we saw just before the, uh, the winter break, uh, are demonstration that the erosions of those institutions can one day affect all of us. So, I think that the European Commission uh, on, Pol on Poland and the Euro Euro European Parliament on Hungary did the right thing when they triggered the so-called Article 7 to respond to the degradation of, of human rights and the rule of law in those two countries. But it's still regrettable to see today that uh, member states now seem to be dragging their feet in holding Orban and Kaczynski into account for uh, their policy in their countries. Um, but uh, if you ask us, I would say that it's extremely important as we are running towards European elections soon, that all parties competing for those elections re-embrace the democratic consensus around rule of law and human rights and do not make a political debate about it. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Yeah, and the main question that comes out of this is, of course, how can you get these governments to adhere to, res to respect fundamental human rights, the norms of democracy? Which will bring us to our first statement. Um, yeah, we can see it on the screen, maybe. Um, our first statement is, is, the EU should condition its funding on a member state respect for the rule of law. So the European, should condition, European Union should condition its funding on the member states' respect for the rule of law. Um, let me first turn to um, our speakers. Um, you have a red and um, a green card. <laughs> if you agree with this statement, you can hold up a green card if you don't agree a red one. Five green ones. <laughs> it's good that we have the audience. Oh, you have two. Okay, good, good. Well, that's interesting. Sophie, we'll hear later on uh, why, why not. Um, just before we get started, if you want to um, uh, put any messages on social media, you can use hashtag um, HR Weekend, Human Rights Weekend. Okay, you know, thank you. Um, okay, then the audience. Um, so let me say this time that you will be in favor of the statement and you got to do the hard job are going to be against, but you're with more. Um, but we will start with um, our speakers. Let me see. Um, well, Sophie, do you want to um, kick off and explain the green and the red yes. card? Okay. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Um, green and red, why? I'm, I'm not opposed to the principle of conditionality. Actually, it should be self-evident that if you apply for EU funding, that you should uh, comply with at least the minimum standards when it comes to values. So I don't think anybody is opposed to that. But uh, if you look a bit more closely, then it's not as simple as it seems. And there are three major uh, downsides to this. One is um, conditionality is 
uh, it, it's actually not going to solve the problem. I mean, you have to answer the question, so who is going to determine and on what grounds whether a country meets the conditions? And I fear that what the member states and the European Commission are aiming for with their conditionality proposal is that it will be civil servants who are anonymous, not accountable, uh, who are going to decide on criteria which will be decided by civil servants. Uh, I think that will, that will actually make the problem bigger. In the European Parliament, we have adopted uh, a proposal for a... Uh, uh, Time a is big, up. Well, let me... Can we... Because no, I, not more. That was one minute. Uh, uh, okay. I thought we were going to have a well-informed debate. I know. It's one minute. Uh, give, me, give me ten more seconds. Okay, five. Yeah? Okay, the second, the, the second problem is that conditionality very quickly becomes a punitive system. People see it as sanctions rather than conditions. And thirdly, uh, it will affect some member states more than others. Austria, for example, where we have a far-right government, is a net uh, contributor and will be hit less hard than, for example, Hungary. So I think there are a couple of snags here. Okay, thank you, Sophie Innesfeld. Um, Anna Milder, would you like to come forward to explain your green card? And please react yeah. to, to um, Sophie Innitveld, if you. you can. I think it's impossible uh, to explain to people in the Netherlands that they have to pay for Poland. Why? Because Dutch judges doesn't, do not send any criminals anymore to Poland because Poland doesn't have any, uh, is not independent, has not enough independent judges. So this is very concrete. So if Poland uh, affects our concerns, uh, security, then it's impossible to explain to people that they have to pay uh, for Poland. So that's why I'm in favor of this uh, statement. But does it work? I'm afraid not. We must do this. But at the end, it's very difficult, as Sophie explained, how do you determine when they uh, violate the rule of law? So we must do other things. But this is very difficult. You need things with a bite. I think at the end, it must come from the Polish people themselves, that they uh, send away their government and have a new normal government. That would be the ultimate solution. Okay, yeah, there's a lot to say about that, but time is up, so thank you, Anna Mulder. Let's move to the audience, because you are against. Uh, who wants to stand up and uh, plea against this statement? <laughs> yeah, please do. There's a microphone. Thank you. Um, the European Union has uh, standard rules for which member states adhere to the Union, access the Union, and operate within the Union. No real uh, conditions are specified for respecting the rule of law. So how exactly uh, do we want now to introduce to 27 member states who have been adhering to the Union at different stages during the past uh, 70 years, a new rule which has not been discussed or whose, which implementation has not been uh, commonly agreed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anybody in this part? Yes, please. So she says, you can't just you know, think of a new rule that wasn't agreed upon in the beginning. Well, that's a, a factually wrong statement. As a Lisbon Treaty or the Treaty of European Union, the Article 2 states the values of European Union, whereas Article 7 states if the values are not respected by the government, then the Council, uh, sorry, the Commission has to take an action. However, I also recognize as the fact that the technocratic uh, institution of the European Union is taking this action, and it was. Uh, both the foreign minister of Poland and uh, Orban suggested this is not a, a, a juridical decision, but this is a political decision. This is a decision based on the majority of the numbers after uh, the report of my honorable friend. <laughs> and so I agree, but the values, they, they are written in the treaty where all at this very moment 28 member states agreed upon. Okay. Thank you. Katy Piri, would you uh, like and comment on the statement? Yes, I showed a green card. Oh, and that was electric. Oh, there are some uh, Sorry. secret services active here in the Bali. Uh, okay, let's start the timer again. Um, why? 
I, we actually both had a green card, but where I didn't agree with my colleague from the FEI today, uh, you can have differences in, in shades of green, apparently, is I can explain very well why Dutch taxpayers should pay money to poorer regions in Eastern Europe, for instance, the country where I was born in Hungary. But I can't explain if we're paying the friends and the oligarchs of Viktor Orban with Dutch taxpayers' money, right? So I think um, it's... It's inexplicable that we are even funding from EU taxpayers' money the same ones who are violating our rights. I think we made some crucial mistakes. With the enlargement, we thought democracy is there. Things will only get better from now on. That's clearly not the case. Democracy is something we need to keep investing in. That's why I agree we haven't invested enough in strengthening civil societies in post-communist countries. But let's not forget this is not an East West issue. It's something which can happen in all our countries when the same type of political parties come into power. And that's why it's crucial that including our Dutch Prime Minister, when he sits around the table with these guys, that he says it to his face, to their face. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's move again to this side. Um, is there anybody who has an argument that could uh, uh, counter that statement. Let me help you. Uh, oh, yeah, good, good. Yeah, if you do, please do. You have it. Yeah, thank you. I think every one of us here have no doubts saying that, okay, the respect for fundamental human rights, respect for rule of law, and also upholding democratic values are three fundamental European values that should be highly appreciated and respected by all of us. But here it's worth strengthening that the topic for our discussion here is to correlate funding directly with the respectful rule of law. So my question, I couldn't help asking, what is the legitimacy of doing this? Okay, good, good question. Can I move to Judith Chagentini? Please come forward. Okay. Um, let me answer that. Uh, the legitimacy is not yet there, uh, and it's a debate between Parliament, Council, and European Commission. And if, if, if the Council would have acted from 2010 onwards, when in Hungary uh, Viktor Orban was re-elected got a two-third majority, we would never have to maybe play with the idea to conditionalize uh, funds uh, on the rule of law. Uh, but as member states have been looking away for close to eight years and they're not saying it to his face or maybe they are but be behind closed doors and not in public we need to find another solution now i'm in favor of conditionality but i do see that one very big risk which is playing a part the east and the west further the point has been made also by sophie uh, and and that is true we are, if we're not very careful, playing a part those that are net payers and those that are net receivers. But I am blaming the other member states, those prime ministers, that thought this problem will solve itself and I don't need to take responsibility. Okay, you just why, and Kati Piri said the, same, said the same thing, that Rutte should uh, speak to Orban right in his face. Why doesn't he do so? Why don't other European leaders don't be very, very clear to Orban or to the Polish leaders? Well, I've asked myself this as well. Two weeks ago, the, uh, the, the Prime Minister in, in Davos at the World Economic Forum started a diplomatic fight with Italy over the, over the budget. So when it is money, our Prime Minister is speaking out. But when it is rule of law, he is not. Now, I know that behind closed doors, the Netherlands and Belgium are actually saying something. But what we need is to show the Hungarian citizens that they are supported by other member states. They have been supported by the European Parliament, two-third majority in favor of the report that I've written, but we want prime ministers to say it out loud, and they don't. Why not? Because if, uh, if, if I don't uh, get in your way, you will not get into my way, and we're losing solidarity within the union. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, this side of uh, the audience, is there anybody who wants to add something in favor of the statement? Anybody on this side? Because then there's 
one final question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Barbara, sorry. You were such in the, so much in the corner. Please, yeah. Um, well, I, I was in Budapest two weeks ago at Central European University, and this is a university in Europe that's in the process of being kicked out of the country. So we're at a stage at this moment where people for speaking out, for being critical, can be uh, told to leave. And to me, seeing this was such a low point. And it seems to me that what's at stake here is something much more fundamental than what's only happening in Poland and only in, in Hungary. I think the heart of Europe is the rule of law. This was why, why Europe was formed in the very first place. If you think about Churchill, if you think about what happened just after the war, that's the raison d'être for Europe. And if we don't speak out effectively on rule of law issues, then this will undermine the whole European project. And this is why, I mean, conditionality, it's a last resort, but it's come to that, the need to pull in this last resort. Okay, thank you. And then a final question to uh, one of the speakers. Um, the answer to that question, uh, why um, Rutte is speaking out about money on Italy and not to Orban if it comes to, uh, you know, uh, politics and the fundamentals of democracy. In that answer, is there somewhere the word Putin and, you know, Orban having a flirt with Putin and, and the Italian leader doesn't? Oh, please, please, please come to the microphone. Say on the contrary, I think that there would be extra reason to speak out against uh, the Hungarian government because they flirt with Putin, because that this that makes our 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 continent less. Uh, certain. And the big difference between Hungary and Poland is particularly the relationship with uh, uh, with uh, with Russia, because Poland is as afraid of Putin as the Baltic states and as we should be which we seem to not be. Okay, good. And Sophie, in felt, please. And Anna, you can also come forward. No, in, indeed, we... Well, I don't dare to touch this thing. <laughs> um, we, we, and this is my problem with this conditionality, because we call it conditionality, which should apply to all the member states. Uh, and, but in, in the debate, it immediately turns into a punitive instrument that will be applied to Eastern European countries. I mean, you might equally, with the same logic, say, well, Western European countries uh, undermine the rule of law in the so-called fight against terrorism, for example. So, you know, they shouldn't qualify for EU funds. But it's immediately become an East-West uh, thing. And I, I think conditionality in itself is not bad. We have sanctions, uh, the Article 7 in the, in the treaty, but Finally, this whole thing is only going to work if society at large takes ownership. And that you don't achieve by just applying sanctions. And that is why the European Parliament, and it's, it, it got very broad support of all the group, including the Christian Democrats, uh, we say we need a, uh, an annual mechanism with a public debate involving the national parliaments so that we as citizens shape this, this culture of values and, and the rule of law and make it ours. Thank you. Anna Mulder for a yeah. final statement. I was here to defend a little bit Mr. Rutte because we're from the same party, but he can defend him, his, himself. But the, the Dutch government is speaking out about rule of law in uh, all these uh, uh, countries. Foreign Affairs Minister, Minister Block will go to Hungary uh, next month. But the problem is we have a couple of... Yeah, then also our parliament, the Dutch parliament, wanted to visit Hungary next week, but the Hungarian government refused to help us, so we're not there. So also as parliament, we have a dialogue with them. But are you saying Rutte is doing enough? Yeah, well, enough. He's, he's quite vocal. But the problem is we have Poland, Romain, Romania, Hung, Hung, Hungary, a lot of countries have troubles with rule of law. So they're defending themselves. And then we have Mr. Orban. The trouble is he's a member of the so-called EPP, the European People's Party, in Parliament, and they don't want to kick him out because they need his votes to have a, a commission uh, uh, president. So there are lots of interests. But I think the Dutch uh, Parliament and also the Dutch government is speaking out loudly. Okay. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, well, ending this session, um, I have to turn to the jury. And uh, I don't know if it was such an unequal fight, I think, because you were really in trouble with something that was quite obvious, no? Do you want to deliberate? Okay. I think that um, the side that is pro 
the condition is stronger. They give uh, a stronger argument, and the best argument was uh, the protection the va of the values of the EU, what stands for, you know, and that I think it's it's a very good uh, argument that uh, got us that got them uh, to the right side. Okay. So, would you agree that we have like a winner on the left side? Uh, yes, I would. I would agree with that. I think um, they had more arguments, more strongly expressed. Um, but I think there were some good caveats that were raised that that need to be taken into account. And you know, the, what I had written down myself that sanctions in this case would be a necessary, though not sufficient, solution, and should be equitably applied to East and West, so that you don't get that pushback in into the split be it you know, things happening counter-terrorism or the French reaction to the Gilets Jaunes uh, protesters or whatever it might be. So, yes, I think there's a clear win on this side, but some very important caveats. Okay. Thank you. The, the green? Okay, good, good. <laughs> Yuda, that was a compliment on your side. Thank you, thank you. We have to move on, because otherwise I'll get, you know, in this sort of time constraint. Next topic is migration. Um, you remember almost three years ago, there was this EU-Turkey deal um, signed. And while the number of migrants arriving um, in Europe that went down, but the issue of migration, of course, isn't solved by far, because still every day people die on the Mediterranean. Um, about 15,000 refugees are stranded on Greek islands in dire conditions. Um, we have the EU-sponsored refugee camp of Moria, and even there the conditions are quite awful. They're unsafe, overcrowded, awful conditions. And uh, we have over 70,000 Syrian refugees that are in an extreme cold in Lebanon now. And then on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, there are now uh, numbers of people fleeing from Venezuela trying to enter safe places like, you know, the Dutch island of Curaçao. So migration still is a very hot topic. We seem to be quite far from a solution as the opinions about migration in European societies are very polarized. Um, the discussions about refugee quota, they proceed very, very slowly. And the Netherlands, for example, even diminished its shelter capacity. So let's move on to statement two. And that is granting asylum to refugees in need of protection is compatible with safeguarding the interests of EU citizens. And if we don't have to discuss really about the interests, because you got to think then about jobs, uh, safeguarding your own culture, these kind of things. Um, may, I see, may I see the cards of our speakers, please? Oh, we've got a bit more diversity. Anna Milder, what is your, your rat? Oh, green, a little bit red. Kati, Kati P is 50%. Okay, green, green. Good, good. Um, we will start this uh, debate with a one-on-one -on -one debate between two opponents. They have five minutes in total in which they can speak in turn, each for 30 minutes. So please come to the fore. 30. So I said minutes, eh? No, seconds. Oh my God, imagine. We'd be here until midnight. Anna Mulder and uh, Judith Sargentini, please come to the fore. Anna, please, um, would you like to start with your reaction to this statement? I think if Take. you ask the Dutch, Dutch population about refugees, they will immediately grant asylum to real political... We have to record you, so we still have to talk into this ah, thing. Okay. Mm. Yeah. I can, I, okay, <laughs> start again. I think if you ask the Dutch population if they want to grant uh, asylum to real refugees, they will immediately say, Yes, because they can understand that people want to leave their country if, they are, uh, if, if the government is after them for, the poli for political reasons. But the problem starts if you have a huge amount of migrants coming to uh, Europe uncontrolled, and then people start saying, what's going to happen? Is our politicians in control? And what does it mean if thousands and thousands of migrants come to our country? Finish your sentence. Switch. Yeah, that means a switch. Uh, what does it mean for our culture? Do they share the same values? So real refugees, yes, but migrants looking for a better life, I think there's not enough support for this among the population. Okay, well, that was in the statement. I, it was, the statement was about sort of political refugees. So well, don't then, take away my language. Sorry. 
Judith, yeah, well, okay. Because this is what happens when you go to a birthday party and you sit in a little round and you have a drink. And we start out talking about asylum seekers, the refugees. And before you know it, we're talking about uh, migrants, economic migrants. So if I stick to the statement, I agree with the statement, but I think it's actually already ridiculous. As if hosting refugees that are seeking a, 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 a safe place is something that we have to balance out with the interest of EU citizens. So in itself, the statement is wrong. Only when you move into your debate, the statement becomes relevant. Okay, so... Um, do you want to enlarge the statement? You see? Yeah, well, we better than enlarge the statement because otherwise everybody agrees, no? Okay, Anna, so um, uh, that we, we say um, it comes to all kinds of, all kinds of people who are entering our country. Um, and then you've got another 30 minutes. Seconds. 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 So that's the we, we agree. Seconds. We agree upon this. Real uh, refugees, you want to help. But the discussion is about uh, lots of migrants coming, looking for a better life. Of course, I can understand. If you live in a country which is poor, and you, you want to go to Europe to have a better life. That's quite human. But can we observe all these uh, people? That's the main question. And if you want to have support for real refugees, you must be strict on people looking for a better life. Okay, then, you, then, we, okay yeah. then we get back to Judith. Okay, I want to pick up on the earlier statement uh, about uh, people coming without, without them being expected or in irregular ways. That's what we organize ourselves, because what, what do we do? Even people that want to ask for asylum cannot knock on our door. They have to take the irregular route. That way, we're actually creating people to get onto boats. If we would open up for, for legal migration and for a possibility to ask for asylum without having re reached the European Union, we would have seen a more, uh, ac a more responsible policy. Okay, Anne Mulder? The best what you can do is accommodate people in their own region. If they leave the country, that they stay in the same region where they uh, come from. And, and then see if they can uh, go back. But this is, you must be very this is a very sensitive uh, topic. It's easy to come to the Netherlands and ask for asylum, but it's, it's quite naive. If you do this, then the support for all refugees will go, and then you are further away from the goal you want to achieve. This I'm is. This is a very classic right-wing right way of debating, as if the left side argues, come to us, we open the gates, flood to us. Nobody suggests that, one. Second, uh, people are being sheltered in the region. The vast majority of refugees is in camps in the region. I read now in Turkey, four million Syrian refugees at the moment. We can cope with those that came to us We're with 500 million Europeans. Okay, thank you. You can go back to your seat. Thank you very much. Um, We move to the audience. Now, this time, it's, uh, you have the right to be in favor. And uh, on this side, you will be against this statement. Uh, let me start with you. Is there anybody who is um, opposing the statement? Can we have a microphone? Yeah, if, if I can catch, like, from the first statement from Mr. Uh, Anne, uh, that he said he cannot tell the taxpayer how they can support the poor countries in Europe. So how can you tell the taxpayer how you support the military regime in Egypt, which creating a lot of refugee, and in the future, it will be like 100 times more than Syria. Syria is like 25 million people, but Egypt is 100 million. And the situation in Egypt now is getting worse and worse, and you keep sending them uh, uh, weapons and money. Can you explain this to the taxpayer also? Okay, thank you. So you're saying we're creating our own uh, yeah. flow of refugees. Is there anybody who wants to react to that from our speakers? Sophie? Sophie? Yes. Oh, oh, to Mr. Well, let, let, let's hear Sophie first and then we have Anna. Yeah. 
No, I, I of course, completely uh, agree with your statement, although I believe you were supposed to argue against, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But never mind, I totally agree with it. I would just, before I make my argument, let me say one thing. Can we stop talking about amounts of people? They're numbers of people. It's a totally different thing. They're individuals. Um, and uh, I, I think migration, yeah. migration is not something that you can decide on. Migration is there. It's a fact of life. It's what people have been doing since day one. Uh, the question is, how do you manage it properly? Because Anna Mulder, I'm sorry to say, the, the whole debate has become toxic, uh, and that has made that we're not looking at the facts anymore. There are not huge numbers of people coming our way, not even in 2015. The peak year, it was something like uh, 1.2 million, which is 0.3% of the population. Give me a break. Is that a threat to our culture? Honestly? Look, we're, and, and at the same time, if you are a Russian mafia boss, an oligarch, you can buy EU citizenship in Malta, for example. Now, how moral is that? So what does that say about a threat to our culture, Mr. Mulder? Now, and finally, I think the only parties who are actually blocking a proper common asylum and migration policy, because the two are inextricably linked, are the anti-migration parties. Now, isn't that funny? Because I think we are the richest, most civilized continent in the world. If we cannot handle it, then who can? Okay, thank you, Sophie in het veld. Anna Mulder, Anna Mulder, there are two people to react to, to Sophie in het veld and uh, react to the sir saying, uh, with supporting the Egyptian uh, leaders, we create our own. Yeah. I think in general we must not support uh, dictatorships and this kind of leaders. I'm not aware of we supporting them in uh, Egypt, but this would be not a good thing, see what they are doing. But then, back to this debate about migration. Don't be naive. Eh? We had the so-called Turkey deal, which worked. Eh? Had lots of migrants coming uh, on the Mediterranean. And my colleague from D66 was, ag uh, not she, but D66 was against it. But then you have to solve these problems with a deal, and perhaps the execution of this deal was not very uh, clean, but it helped. And then people thought, well, politicians are back in control when it comes to migration. And if politicians like me are not in control, people go to the more radical wings, left and right. That, that's, that's what happens if, if you don't solve this problem. But, but so, you say it works. Just important. go back to that, no, because otherwise it will be a fact-free debate. You say it worked, but it worked from one side that Turkey stopped refugees from coming to Europe. Yeah. But it didn't work in the European Union, taking up refugees yeah. from Turkey and di distributing them amongst no, their no, members. The flow of migration uh, decreased, but then it comes to solidarity in the European Union. Exactly. And then again we have Hungary. They don't want to observe uh, migrants, so we have a discussion to go there. But we must make this kind of deals with countries, sometimes with countries you don't like, to solve the problem. Otherwise you are out of control as politicians, and if you're out of control, people start not voting for you, but they go for the more radicals, which, which do not have no solutions at all. No, clear. Um, Philippe, you well, want to I react? I had scrap there. So <laughs> oh, you, 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 well, well, you, you, you'll, have to, you'll have a chance to react to Sophie. Uh, let's um, prevent the, the political leaders who you know, use migration as a scapegoat a, a, aside because we should not let them be the drum and look at migration policies in, a, in an appeased way. And um, I think a number of, of, um, of, of, of situations that Human Rights Watch documented throughout Europe show that deliberate human rights violations continue to take place against migrant and asylum seekers, and those violations are in no way justified by the needs of a migration policy. You mentioned the overcrowding of the camps on the Greek islands, you mentioned death at sea, you mentioned the situation of migrants detained in Libya and exposed to torture, death and exploitation. We can also mention pushbacks accompanied of violence, uh, you know, from Croatia to Bosnia or from Greece to Turkey at the land border where people are beaten up, stripped of their clothes, thrown away, stolen their belongings, those situations are just not absolutely not justifiable for the migration policy. So I think we need to come back to the basics and look for accountability against those abuses, for some kind of solidarity where the countries on the you know, external borders who naturally receive more migrations can uh, be alleviated from that pressure. And, 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 and thirdly, we need to find uh, a greater space for safe and legal channels in order to prevent people to have to be forced to take very dangerous ways when they have to. And you say, as um, uh, Anna Milder was saying, the uh, Turkey deal has worked. That's, you say, it hasn't really, because 
all of these. If you ask me again, uh, the no, EU Turkey deal. Sure. I was just, you know, uh, summing up. Uh, right. I mean, the EU Turkey deal is a distraction in itself. Uh, what was it create, su supposed to do? Uh, I mean, does, it, does, does, the, does the deal itself had a consequence on the diminution of arrival? We don't think so. Uh, is the deal used to justify abuses against people stranded for now three years on the Greek islands? Yeah. Yes, and this in itself is not at all something which should have been part of the, of, of the recipe. Good, good, thank you. Anna Müller, yeah, I promised him to have a chance to react to Sophie Innitfeld. Do... Okay. <laughs> okay, wait. Kati, Kati Piri, please. There actually, you know, it's a difficult debate and there are valid arguments, I think, being made by, by all the speakers, although I don't agree with any of them 100%. Um, but is there a tension in it? Yes. Otherwise, all these political parties rising against migrants wouldn't be able to get so much support. What I hate in the debate is when we start dehumanizing people, whether they are refugees or migrants, they are people, right? I think that's very important in the debate. But we also know, yes, we can handle, we could handle more than one and a half million refugees in 2015. But what was the unfair part of it is that most of them came to certain countries. And, the, and within the countries, the day they came exactly in those neighborhoods where the people were already having a more difficult time. You know, so it's easy to speak uh, in, in the places where probably most of us are living that the rest of society can take them up. But I think also then within our society, we need to have solidarity. And this is something, you know, that, and, and control, I do agree with the Faith Today that that is an important aspect of it, but not just controlling the border, right? So we also need to, uh, need to be able to show on this rich continent that yes, we can take up people Your fleeing. Up. Sorry. Ah, there was no bus, so uh, I no, thought I can no. continue. Uh, but I'm watching. <laughs> um, Sophie, in it felt, please do. Uh, well, first of all, in, in response to what Kati Piri just said, yes, of course, uh, the whole of Europe will have to share the the burden, uh, as it's called, uh, of welcoming refugees and migrants, including labor migrants. But that is the whole point. And it is the national governments who are blocking a solution in the European Parliament and the European Commission. There is now a consensus, there is a broad majority for this solidarity mechanism, which indeed would make it possible to manage the migration flows, but it is national governments blocking it, and governments on the whole, dear Anne Mulder, of the more populist tendency. They are blocking a proper migration policy. And secondly, and second, secondly, secondly, okay, I'll come back to that if you'll allow me. Uh, that's a bit easy. Uh, secondly, we are very critical, almost everybody in, in Europe is very critical of the wall of Trump. But Fortress Europe is what the governments are building in the Mediterranean, and it is the European equivalent of the wall of Trump. It is really no better, and it should end. Okay, thank you. Okay, Judith Sartatini, and then I'll come here to the audience. Six refugees or migrants the, uh, the Netherlands took uh, just before Christmas from that Sea Watch boat. And the last boat, no refugees, because the State Secretary had said, this is once, but never again. I had a really bad week when uh, we had an agreement here in the Netherlands, in, in the government, where both of your parties are in, where uh, indeed we're giving a pardon to children, but they're lowering the amount of people that is allowed, and I beg your pardon to talk about amount, but we're lowering the resettlement numbers from 750 to 500. What is proper migration and refugee policy? It's making sure that it's predictable. And resettlement is predictable. You know people are coming, you can facilitate that. If you take away legal access to the union, like our government has done, you make it less predictable, you create more people on boats. Thank you. In favor. Well, I, I mean, can, can, can no, you just... Okay, but you don't need to hold it for me because I prefer to hold it yeah, myself, I please. To, yeah. Okay, then. No, that's how we do it. Yeah. No, I, I prefer to hold it myself. Yeah. Okay, well, you can if, we have to, if you have the minutes counting. Thank you. I, I will give it back to you, I promise. But, uh, you know, I, I just would like to go back to the, uh, to the initiation of this debate with the question about what need of protection, what, how do we define that need of protection? Because certainly most people who come from the boats have a need of protection. 
but do we define it according to international law as who has asylum rights or do we define it broader and I think then you know some people perhaps not in this room but overall in the European population may disagree so I, I'm not sure if I come out in favor of the statement or against I just think it needs to have more definition okay is there anybody who wants to react to that Not really, then we just leave it out in the open. Can I go to the other side? Is there anybody who's, who has a, a strong argument against this statement? Yes, in the back, please. Um, I guess I'm going to kind of replicate what you just did and not argue against, but a bit more for. Um, <laughs> kind of balance it out. Just as uh, somebody just was saying, if we're judging Trump on building a wall and saying America first and American values need to come first, then how are we any better saying that EU citizens' rights or values need to come first and we can't accommodate all of these people who are coming and we can't protect their rights and protect their values and integrate them into our societies um, with the European project being built on everybody living together and um, cohabitating in a way which makes us all better people in a sense, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Thank you, it's a beautiful statement, but you're sort of frustrating my, my game, with, <laughs> which you're supposed to be against. <laughs> but it was a beautiful statement. Thank you. Is there anybody here in favor who still wants to say something? Yes, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I will not argue. Um, so. Yes, the deal with Turkey, I'm sorry, it didn't work in humanitarian ways, right? People, people still drowning. The Netherlands only took in 1,200 people, whereas they should have taken in many more. So nobody's taking leadership in Europe. The resettlement scheme with, with Greece just ended. So Greece is now stuck with all these people. Um, so, and by the way, the land border is not within the EU-Turkey deal, and there's 15,000 people coming over that border just this year. So... Resettlement is, is the only way to, to foster legal roots. Um, Netherlands went from 750 to 500. I think that's really shameful. Um, I've just been in Canada for a year. They have the private sponsorship scheme. They have 25,000 resettlements every year. Also private sponsorship, right? Groups of friends, churches. I really don't understand why the Netherlands is not looking into that because other like eight European countries are looking into it right now. So that would be a great addition, actually. Okay, thank you. Katy Piri. I agree with the statement that uh, we really didn't keep up the good parts also of the EU Turkey deal. But the thing that frustrated me very, very much is that that was the moment, the big window of opportunity for a large scale resettlement program. We had Merkel saying we want to take over 500,000 people per year. We had, at that moment, my, uh, my political leader calling for 200,000 per year. And we all failed progressives to come together on this. And because we were, you know, only busy whether the EU-Turkey deal is a shame or it's not a shame, we forgot to build up this alliance for, uh, for, um, uh, for large-scale resettlement. And the, I, I see Canada, one of my points there, they're also using it very much for migration. Let's be honest, it's not just for protection of refugees. And they don't have a natural flow, uh, a natural asylum applications coming in. So, uh, the, you know, that's always the difference with Canada. It's hard to compare. It's a bit apples and pears, isn't it? Um, uh, is there anybody who really wants to react? Yes, Sophie Inetfeld, then you have the, like, the, the last reaction before we end this statement? Okay, maybe by way of uh, uh, a, a, a peace branch in a way, because I, I think it is very easy to discuss these matters uh, in a setting like this, and I think most of us in this room agree on how we would shape asylum and migration policies. Uh, the point about politics is that politics is never about wrong or right. It's only about shitty dilemmas. Everybody has to take very difficult decisions. The question is, are we willing to take responsibility? Are we willing to, to try and make alliances where possible to find solutions? Are the solutions satisfactory? No, 
they're not. Uh, I think they're short-sighted. Uh, I think we are only talking about refugees, whereas everybody knows that we should be talking about labor migration as well. But I think the one uh, objective, the one uh, uh, responsibility that we all have in this room and in our, in our own uh, constituencies is to put those issues on, on, on the table and to fight for it together rather than fighting each other. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move to our jury because um, I must say that our statements are a bit hard to really find, uh, you know, an equal battle between the two sides. Um, is there anything you have, you know, that was remarkable or that you really particularly liked about the, uh, the argument? Well, I think, I mean, it, it's, it's good this, this argument that we just heard is closing because we kind of strayed from the broader definition of the question. Uh, and I think much of the debate actually did focus on the quote-unquote real refugees, although one could argue with, with that definition. I think, uh, at least from our sense, it is, it is a clear win for, yes, it is in keeping, and yes, we should allow them. Um, I think that the, the notion of the Turkey deal having worked is a, is a from the arguments, quite one-sided as it appears, and sort of what, what Americans would call kicking the can down the road. The problem is there, it's not going to go away, it's being bottled up elsewhere. So are we as Europeans just adding to the problem and just pushing it a bit down the road to a point where, where it's going to get worse? And I think then the second point is, coming back to our first statement, in keeping with the European values, I heard a lot of discussion about the, the human aspects of it. Is that not in keeping with the European values that we're trying to protect? I think the strongest also uh, element, color that came out uh, from this side, not from that side, oh. it was uh, the, you know, like creating, creating Trump wall. Yeah. And is, is the EU, you know, like helping with that? Yeah. And that was very strong. Thank you. So the winners are on stage. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, we move to our third, um, to our third debate, actually, our final debate. I hope that one will sort of like this progressive audience will have a bit of division in itself. I, I think so, because we will talk about, um, about uh, terrorism. So, um, and of course, that is an issue that has been concerning us all and that was rated on uh, the Politico's 2018 survey of top concerns for EU citizens, terrorism. Europe has been dealing with, uh, with terrorist attacks, we all know them. Uh, recent arrests, also in the Netherlands, they also indicate that the threat isn't over yet. Um, yeah, in the last years, several European governments have launched some policies to, to counter terrorism. But um, the problem is that their surveillance often violates uh, human rights and the, the privacy of civilians. The new regulations to protect the data of citizens and they provide exemptions in case of a security threat. So let's move to our final statement of today and that is the potential threat of terrorism doesn't justify mass surveillance. So let me see um, who's going to be in favor and who's going to be against. Um, let's say in favor and let's say against. So you are against the statement that the threat of ter terrorism doesn't justify mass surveillance. You're going to argue it does actually, mass, mass surveillance is allowed. But let's move to our speakers. Can we please show your cards? Oh, here are yours, Anna. <laughs> green, 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 and? Green, green. <laughs> okay, we've got five times green. Um, what we're gonna do now is we'll have all five uh, come to the fore, and uh, I think you'll have, yeah, you have one minute uh, to comment on the statement. Let's just do it that way. Kati, if you'd like to start, and then after you, Philippe. You see, if there's no difference anymore from all the way uh, Greens to Faith Fide in the statement, then uh, uh, <laughs> let's see. I think it's, it, at least how I feel it, and uh, is the task of Europe, is to protect the fundamental rights of citizens. And we all know that terrorism is a big infringement on those fundamental rights. Um, but also mass surveillance, of course, is. Why would we go after 500 million citizens and have a breach into their uh, privacy when we know they are not all potential terrorists? Apart from the fact that I also don't think it would have 
it would be effective at all. What we have seen actually in the last, I'm checking the clock, what we have seen is that those people who in the past have done terrorist attacks in Europe were almost all already on certain watch lists. So why would you uh, breach uh, fundamental rights when you can have a much more targeted response? Thank you. Perfectly in time. Philip, please come to the fore. Yes, so of course states have a duty to protect their population and uh, security legislations are not something which they cannot take. But the question is, is whether those policies are uh, proportionate and necessary for the purpose of protecting the population against, uh, against terrorism, whether people have access to safeguards, to uh, judicial oversight. And, and what we've been seeing in a number of EU countries is that this is not the case. A recent legislation from two years ago in Poland again uh, allows almost unlimited control of uh, citizens uh, with very little judicial oversight, allow the internal security agency to invite control and surveil every foreigner in Poland without any oversight for several weeks. How is that um, um, necessary and justified to fight against terrorism? So this is really the framework which we have to look into. And, and unfortunately, again, the recent EU uh, directive on terrorism uh, fails uh, in, in, in a number of ways to, to meet all those, those criteria. And that's something we have to be very careful as states implement those directives. Okay, thank you. Sophie and it felt? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, it is not justified in, in the legal sense. As Philip said, there is a legal requirement that any surveillance measure has to be necessary and proportionate. And that means that you're able to demonstrate that there are no other less invasive means to achieve the same goal. Uh, there is plenty of case law from the European Court of Justice and the Human Rights Court in Strasbourg, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 annulling uh, legal measures from the EU and the member states time and time again because it's not necessary and it is not proportionate. I have myself challenged uh, the French surveillance law in court. Uh, I have taken it now to the Human Rights Court in Strasbourg. We're waiting for uh, a verdict. So I know from first-hand experience that as a citizen you have zero protection, zero rights, never mind the so-called legal safeguards that are in the legislation. And finally, we see that a lot of data are being, uh, are being collected on us in the member states, but the member states amongst each other don't exchange information, so we get no security in return. But they're quite happy to give the American authorities direct access to our data without any legal safeguards. So if we are worked up about Facebook, we should be 10 times more worried about the, the unlimited powers that we have created for secret services and police. Thank you. Judith Sagatini, please. Building upon the colleagues, uh, the, the real issue is why do politicians, after a terrorist attack happened, have to respond with something oppressive? Uh, this is what they think people want to hear. They, wanna, uh, they want to see management. They want to see action. So what do you come with? Uh, measures that, that people can understand, and it's not really relevant whether they work or not. We are a very sensitive society. In a Western society, a terrorist attack can be done very easily. You rent a car or you you, you hijack a car, whatever. You can do that. So the response into, into mass surveillance is not the response. The response is a responsible society, an inclusive society where everybody gets his, his place and its, and its respect. That, I think, to cre create security in society, and I'm a bit bad in explaining it now, creating security in society is about creating respect in society. But this is creating disrespect in society. Now, Surveillance, yes, but mass surveillance, no. And the bad thing is that, Katy already said it, people were all on the watch list, but we didn't act on that. Could we spend our money and our effort on checking out those that are on the watch list? Please. Thank you, Judith Sargentini. Anna Mulder, last but not least. Yeah. Thank you. Well, my colleagues said a lot about uh, the balance that uh, terrorism in Terrorism is an infringement of your, your life, but that it must be proportional. So I agree upon this. Um, what I can add is that I see 
a little swing in the mood, also in a political group, because we see Amazon, we see Facebook, and I see more and more people uh, concerning concerned about their uh, privacy. So I see a little swing in the uh, discussion. Then I think you must not do ma mass su 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 surveillance. But if you target uh, a terrorist and you want to track him down, then I can understand that you will wiretap somebody. But don't do this in, in, in general, is my, uh, my point. But I think the debate is swinging. People like the privacy more than they did before. In my political group, lots of people said, well, I'm not a terrorist, so they can have all my information. Yeah, that's what people said. And I, didn't, I don't hear this anymore. So that's interesting. How, how do you explain debate. for that swing? I think this, that Amazon and Facebook, that people are getting more and more concerned what is going to, uh, on with their personal information. Abuse. Yeah. yeah, abuse of it. So people are a little bit more f afraid of this. That's what, what I'm smelling. Okay, thank you. Smelling, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Anna Milder. Um, let me move to this side. Uh, is there anybody who would say, um, yeah, the potential threat of terrorism is so bad and the consequences are so awful that it does justify mass surveillance? It doesn't have to be your own opinion, huh? It's about creative arguing, arguments. No one? Yeah? <laughs> I mean, before saying that, and personally, I don't agree with... Um, <laughs> no, 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 you, you don't yeah, have to agree to, with... Just to proposing an argument, I would say, yeah. it is true, just as you said, you know, legally speaking, when it comes to the surveillance, surveillance these measures should be, uh, should be necessary and also should be appropriate, as you said. But also, legally speaking, on the international level and also on the regional level, according to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and also based upon the European Convention on Human Rights, legally speaking, derogation of certain human rights is allowed in situations of, you know, uh, let's say emergency. The typical example is the potential serious threat of terrorism. So in this sense, you know, certain amount of surveillance by uh, the governments under exceptional circumstances is reasonable and also legal. But that being said, we, of course, we should caution against abuse of powers and abuse of discretion by governments, obviously. Yeah. Okay, so even if you say there, there are good arguments, uh, the abuse is always, is always, is never allowed actually. Let's move to this side. Is there anybody who wants to add something to, uh, in favor of the statement? Yes, please. Well, not only I am against mass surveillance, but also targeted surveillance should be limited. Because as we have seen in the Netherlands, the association that speaks against Vertebrit is considered, uh, considered a terrorist uh, association. So just because of the color of their skin, the color of their skin or because of their uh, position in society, they might be targeted more. We see that uh, police is using uh, big data to control certain neighborhoods. That is targeted surveillance. Uh, we see that, yeah, they know when to, to read before time because they're able to know what people, they don't even, people are not getting the, the, even the potential to speak out. So, yeah, I would say not against mass surveillance, but targeted surveillance should also be limited. Yeah, you sharpen the statement, actually. Is there anyone of our speakers who wants to react to that? Sophie Insfeld. Well, uh, Again, the legal requirement of necessity and proportionality also applies, obviously, to targeted surveillance. Um, I, I don't think, um, and I, I don't think that that is what Judith meant, but I, I think, you know, uh, having a, 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 a nice, pleasant society where everybody treats each other with respect, uh, that's what we would all like, but we also know that, that that doesn't exist, and there are lots of bad people out there, so that we need to equip the law enforcement and security authorities with the necessary means, but never beyond what is necessary. And the point is that you, you, that's a, a kind of permanent process of checks and balances. You know, is this proportionate or not? Are there maybe other ways of achieving the same goal? Uh, but it is very, very difficult as um, counterterrorism used to be, uh, you know, it's somewhere in between uh, intelligence, security, and regular law enforcement. And that makes a difference because in law enforcement, uh, uh, civil rights are stronger and oversight mechanisms are a lot stronger than in the area of intelligence and security. Because that is, that's very invisible in, in its nature. Uh, and that is 
why, um, you know, in, in recent years, this whole counterterrorism debate has shifted into that area of intelligence and it's becoming increasingly difficult to verify what is going on and if the means applied are indeed justified, proportionate and, and necessary. And we should be very worried about this as a society. And I think we're not nearly worried enough. We're sleepwalking. Yeah. Who wants to react to that, to what Sophie Innitfeld just said? No one? Any one of the speakers who is eager to give a reaction? Yeah, please, Judith Tragentini. Next to the legal argument that I fully share with you, I think the issue of mass surveillance gives a fake sort of false sort of security. That I've, it, it gives this, the idea that we're doing something, but in the meantime, we're not spending the time and effort on the real signals. And the, the example was this, this, uh, this uh, shoe bomber that was on the flight from, uh, some, from, from the Far East via Schiphol to Detroit, I think. This guy, his father called the embassy, the US embassy, and said, my son is up to no good. But nobody took that signal. And if you go about the the various uh, attacks in the European Union, you can very often see that they were somewhere on the radar, but 24-7 uh, security is very expensive. The, 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 the twins that did the attack on Charlie Hebdo, they were returning from Syria. They were on a 24-7 surveillance until a couple of weeks before they attacked. So we're putting our money in the wrong thing, giving people a false idea of security and with that, I think, in, uh, inflicting real trouble. Okay, Sophie, in it fell. Thank you, Judith. Yeah. Just 10 seconds in addition, because uh, Judith raised the issue of, you know, where do we put our money? I think something that we urgently need to look into is the money. You know, follow the money. There is a whole security industry. There are people who are, are, are making shitloads of money out of our fear. Now, you know, I'm a market liberal. I've got nothing against companies making a buck. Uh, but not riding roughshod over uh, the rule of law and fundamental rights. So we need transparency in the financial interests behind this whole security industry. Yes. Wait, wait, wait for the microphone. You mentioned, you mentioned earlier that there is no cooperation between EU members when it comes to intelligence. Yeah. And, and there is no agreement, there is no process to work on that. So they share with the Americans, but yes. not among themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's so roughly that, it. I mean, so, so of, course there is, of course there is sharing of information, but it's very limited. It is it's unregulated. There is no oversight because we may have... We may have strong oversight over the Dutch intelligence uh, 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 services, but whatever they do together with other intelligence services, we don't know. We cannot verify that. We have no mechanisms. And yes, it is absolutely true that uh, where member states are very, uh, EU member states are very reluctant to share information. Uh, for example, you remember we worked on the uh, the, the, the passenger uh, uh, the, the passenger data, where all member states are now collecting passenger data, uh, and we in the European Parliament we wanted an obligation for European states to share the information. They refused that, but now they are ready to give direct access to uh, f for American law enforcement authorities to companies in Europe holding data in Europe and forcing them to hand over data which are stored in Europe and which should be governed by European laws. I, I also have the sense it's not only among member states, but within member states. If we remember what happened during the whole spate of terrorist incidents in Brussels, and you had this, oh, the, the, the left hand didn't know what the right yeah. hand was doing. But that was 9-11 oh, as well. Eh? Yes. I mean, it's, but it's, it's every, every service is becoming its own little kingdom. And people, I mean, this, this seems to be human nature. Uh, and that is why, uh, you know, that is, that is why in Europe, for example, where anybody can, uh, can travel freely, uh, we should also have cooperation and sharing of information. Because if information is not being shared, that means we get no additional security for, in return for those security policies. And that means that they are not justified. So the, the mere fact, the mere fact that member states are not sharing information means that legally speaking, 
the mass surveillance is completely unjustified. Legally speaking, you can challenge it in court. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody who has something to add in favor or against? Oh, yes, please. Yeah, I find it very, very important uh, opportunity. We have uh, a lot of the decision maker here, so I also will take the terrorism word and ask them, how do you see uh, the uh, Europe, European society and the politician supporting a lot of terrorism, new terrorism coming out of Egypt, f fleeing to Syria to fight there, and later they will be in Europe or somewhere also so how do you react in this and you still till today or not, not not all of you but some of politician still supporting cc and saying that he is the solution of uh, like protecting europe from refugee and terrorists but that's not the the reality and if you read the amnesty reports and the human rights watch uh, reports you see that there is every day people going to be a very radical and very T terrorists because of what they see in Egypt. So I really would like to hear from you. Okay, Yuri Sargentini, you may react. Thank you. What you're sketching is short-term responses by governments. I'm very happy to hear that the new that we're finally debating again here in the Netherlands to bring back these women and children from Syria. Uh, the, the policy has been just let them rot over there. The uh, uh, others were arguing against this will lead to very disturbed young people that will find revenge towards the Netherlands. And I agree there. I think we need to bring these women and children back to, 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 to host them, of course, to let them uh, put them into uh, put them in front of a court for if they done uh, criminal acts, but to make sure that these children have a normal upbringing. Now, when it comes to Egypt, Sisi is Mubarak 2.0, but what did we Europeans think? And I was the only one in European Parliament that called it a coup d'etat at that point. What we think is that Sisi is protecting us against Muslim Brotherhood, and we're, we're creating the next fire. After what we used to call the Arabic Spring, People uh, liberated themselves, we em embraced that, but it went too far with Morsi, uh, 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 who is a Muslim Brotherhood guy. So again, what, we, what do we do? Short-term policies, because the buffer in North Africa uh, towards us is created by the Mubaraks of this world, still. Okay, thank you, Judith. Anybody else? Because otherwise we're closing this, this statement. Then I walk to my jury to see if there's some uh, remarks still to be made, because I don't know if, if there's a winner or... <laughs> I think it was, it was hard to hear some arguments from, from the other side. Uh, so I think we, we'd have to agree that, that everyone makes very convincing arguments against mass surveillance. Um, and there is a legal basis for proportionality and necessity uh, and also a very clear case, I thought, all around for far better leverage of the information that we do have where people are already on watch lists and red alerts and we're still bumbling that and creating barriers that, that are preventing our safety. You agree? Okay, thank you. Can I then have a big applause from my jury? Because. They weren't prepared for that, but they were brave enough. Thank you very much. Um, finally, I wanted to give uh, our uh, five speakers the opportunity for a closing statement, which should be um, a take-home message for our audience with respect to human rights. You may um, look forward to the parliamentary elections. Um, Anna Milder, may I start with you? There will be a buzzer, I hear. I don't know if I have to take, uh, take home message, but what bothers me is, and that was the first statement, is that we see the upcoming of illiberal democracies. We see that Poland, Hungary, Turkey, India, uh, Russia. So these it are democracies, because the leader is uh, uh, voted by a majority of the people, but it's illiberal. It's violating human rights. And the question is what to do about it. Yeah, we had it about EU funding. But I'm looking for the silver bullet to, to, to solve this. And that is my main concern at the moment. So if anybody has uh, some silver bullets, I would be happy.
Okay, who has a silver bullet can uh, can uh, can talk to Anna Mulder afterwards. Thank you, Anna. Judith, may I give you the floor? There is no such thing as a silver bullet. There's such a thing as responsible politics by politicians that do not try to only please their audience, but also tell them that it is difficult, that it's not black and white. And I think the European elections, on which I'm not standing, uh, the European elections should be about values. And if you are unhappy with the policy you've seen before, you need to maybe reconsider your vote. Because what is the signal I think we need to take home from the fact that two-thirds of the European Parliament voted in favour of my Hungary report? Values count and solidarity is key. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sophie Innitfeld. Your final 30 seconds this afternoon. Yes, thank you. The European Union is a community of values and a community of law. But it's not enough to make that statement or to write it into treaties. We have to make it a community of values and a community of law. And even progressive pro-European people tend to say, oh, well, the European Union is very good for economics, internal market, you know, we earn a nice salary. But we leave it to the populists to define what the values of the European Union are. They, I mean, pay attention. They're not talking about money or economics. They're talking about values and identity. And we should embrace that argument in the European elections. Thank you. <laughs> Philippe Dam, please. Right. I'd like to say that I'm sometimes a bit worried when I see leaders of political parties, in fact, fighting f ahead of the European elections. Uh, saying that they will represent democracy and rule of law in the elections. In fact, that should be a consensus among all parties and not an issue of debate. And uh, the question of values is definitely something which, which is at risk today. But, uh, but obviously, uh, seeing one, there, there, is not, there should not be one party embodying it, but it should be a common value that, that all share uh, in the approach of these elections. Thank you. Kathy <laughs> Peely, finally. Many debates I'm having in always in campaign time is, you know, what does Europe do for us? It's not about jobs, the debate we're having here. It's not about climate. You know, it's about something, a luxury, right? Human rights. What I think is clear to all of us in this room is human rights, it's not a luxury. First of all, it's global. It's not only for EU citizens. It's the rights for everyone on this planet. On irrespective of where they were born. And if we do not respect them, we get what many of you mentioned. We will have more repression, more terrorism, more, more people uh, having to move. So I think if there's one thing to take home, it, where this is not a luxury topic, this is at the core of the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the Human Rights Watch weekend is, is nearing its end, but I wanted to um, uh, put your attention to two films that are still worthwhile uh, seeing. They're both Dutch premieres. They'll be, uh, you can see them here tonight. It's at six o'clock, Ghost Fleet, documentary about slavery in the Thai fish industry that's also supplying Europe. And at half past eight, it's Screwdriver, a drama film about a Palestinian man trying to readjust to a changed society and life after having spent 15 years in Israeli jail. So um, finally, make sure in May you're going to cast your vote for the European elections. Thank you very much for your contribution and have a lovely evening.